Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. Praise God. We're going to jump right in. If you would turn in your word to 1 Corinthians, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We are at the end of our series of making Jesus known. It's our series about sharing Jesus with the lost and evangelism. <clears throat> and today I want to share with you five appeals to unbelievers. And this is equipping for us as Christians and as the church, but it's also for you in this room today, if you would say that I'm, I'm still not sure about Jesus, I'm still, I'm still not completely a believer or I'm still seeking. Well, first of all, we wanna say welcome. You're in a good company because we've all been there, whether you're online or in person. And uh, so we, I, I, I pray that today and we pray today together that this message speaks to you. Uh, I will say that some of this has a little bit of apologetics in it. In other words, the word apologia, meaning a defense for the faith. And I'm not gonna go into major detail of that, um, although it is a subject I love to study and learn. Uh, but what I'm gonna give you is five reasons really to believe in Jesus. Five reasons to believe that I will go to my grave uh, with, and there's more, there's more reasons uh, than just what I'm giving, but I'm giving you five very strong arguments and pleas and appeals that you should believe in Jesus Christ today. Amen? Uh, first of all, let's define appeal. Appeal means to make a serious or urgent request. To make a serious or urgent request. Uh, a plead means to make an emotional appeal. So they really mean the same thing. And there comes a time when you have ministered to someone long enough, uh, there's a, there comes a time where the Holy Spirit puts it on your heart to make a loving appeal to a person out of great concern for their soul. And that is love. If you're in the room today and someone invites you to come, because I had, I had encouraged everyone to invite, or maybe you're gonna share this message one day, um, there, someone's sending this message to you and someone has invited you because they love you. And they're concerned for your soul. And so we as Christians believe what we live and what we have believed. And so we make a loving appeal. And many times for me, it's been a prompting of the Holy Spirit to do this. So let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 to give you an idea of what I mean. Because Paul practiced this <clears throat> in his ministry. Paul made appeals and pleaded with people on behalf of God. And this is what it says in 2 Corinthians 5. 18 through 21, and all of this is a gift from God. Right before that, he talked about salvation and change, who brought us back to himself through Christ. God brought us back to him through the cross of Christ, and God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. We were separated by our sin. God has brought the task and God has uh, accomplished this mission uh, with Christ, and now it's their task to tell this message that you can come back to God and be in a relationship. That broken relationship is being, has been reconciled through Christ, and I'm giving it away in the next verses, but again, it says, and God has given us this task, this is Paul and others with him, of reconciling people to him. Verse 19, for God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. Isn't that great? Praise the Lord. He doesn't have a listing of, of counting all these sins against you. He sees the cross and wants to count that as credit towards you and for you. Praise the Lord for that. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ ambassadors. We speak for God. In other words, we're sent ones. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. 
For God made Christ, now this is the gospel right here. This is the good news. For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God. But it has to be done through Christ and no other means. I mean, really, that is my sermon. This, this has everything I'm about to say in it, but I want to break some of those things down. Uh, it's important to understand that when you're making an appeal or I make appeal to you, that this is not a substitute for what the Holy Spirit needs to do in someone's life. Paul said this in uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 4, my message and my preaching were very plain Rather than using clever and persuasive speeches, I relied only on the power of the Holy Spirit. So I'm not coming to you with crafted messages that are supposed to be so influential and powerful uh, by my own power or creativity. I come to you out of prayer and waiting on the Holy Spirit to give you a message, but also to give you the word because Romans 1.16 says it is the power to save. The gospel is the power to save, not your really good writing skills or speech. It's the power of the gospel preached that reaches into the soul and the Holy Spirit uses the word of God like a sword to cut in deep and to convict and to move and to encourage and to inspire someone to believe. That's what takes place. Just to give you another reference, 1 Thessalonians 1.5, for when we brought you the good news, it was not only with words, but also with power. For the Holy Spirit gave you full assurance, or the NIV says deep conviction that what we, that what we said was true. Now, I'm going to get into this more for us as a church because I'm going to leave a plea with the church at the end. But what that says is, is that the Holy Spirit takes the message that you share with your friends, or today, if you're here today and you're an unbeliever, the Holy Spirit wants to take this message and he wants to convince you that it's true, because it is. <clears throat> so let's get into some appeals. The first one I wanna share with you, and this is, a, I've earned my place to share this. I've loved people, I've blessed people, I've been in their lives, and it's time for me to share something because I'm concerned for their soul. And one of the things I'm gonna share is really simple. God created, loves, and longs to be in a relationship with you. That's number one. God created you, God loves you, and God longs to be in a relationship with you. I don't know if you know this, but we are meant to be in a relationship with God. God created you. He made you for himself. He made you to be in relationship with him. But because of what happened in the garden of sin, and he had to separate us from him because of his holiness, and we became sinful. And so that separation began because of our sin. He didn't want that, but we chose that. We chose that. But God is so loving so gracious that Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He loved you before you got everything fixed. He loved you at your worst. And that love is supposed to draw you to him. Uh, this other scripture that I think really just reiterates the same thing in 2 Corinthians 5, Colossians 1, 19 through 20. If you notice, I'm giving you scripture for every uh, appeal. Colossians 1, 19 through 20, for God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. So God was in Christ, Christ is God. The Trinity here, the Holy Spirit working. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He fixed the brokenness. He brought us back to him. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Not your blood, not my blood, Christ's blood. The blood of Jesus Christ has given you forgiveness of sins if you will believe. And because of that, you can come back to God. Now, before I go on to the next appeal, I want you to understand this too, that the fact that God has created you also answers the big questions of life that we all have. Like, what is the meaning of life? Who am I? 
Where did I come from? Why am I here? And where am I going? What's my identity? What was I supposed to be? Who was I supposed to be? All of that is found in your creator. And the world scorches the earth to try to figure out their true identity. And all along, it's been in whose who's you are and what God says you are and who God says you are. The questions that you're struggling to find out about your life are found in the creator who made you for himself to be in fellowship with you. I would appeal to you, my friend, to believe in Jesus Christ because God wants to have a relationship with you. God created you to be with him. Come be and come back to God and come be with him. Amen. Amen. Secondly, we need to understand that sin is real and destructive, but the world offers no solution. The world has failed to give you a solution for your sin problem. We have all witnessed the effects of sin personally and in our society, and it makes us sick to our stomachs, doesn't it? You have been hurt by sin. You have sinned. We all have sinned. Romans 5, 12 says, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all people because all sinned. Romans uh, 3, 23 says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We look to the world for answers to fix our brokenness, pain, and sinful actions, but it has no answer. Let me show you what the world does offer. The world offers temporary distractions, such as wealth, power, and pleasure, that they hold, and, but they hold no redeeming qualities. They can't save you. Not sure if you've noticed that, but all those things will burn. In the end, these distractions are tools from the devil to keep us from seeing the true solution to the problem of sin. This, my friend, is what concerns me the most. The world tries to give you an answer with power and position and pleasure, but it will always fail. It never fixes your behavior. That's why rap artists have always said, mo money, mo problems. That's why Tom Brady, after he won five rings, still was not happy with his life. He still said there has to be more. My friend, let me tell you, there is more. There's something that will last forever. It's Jesus and the heaven that he's preparing for you. Amen. 1 John 2, 15 through 17 warns us, do not love the world nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father or God in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see and the pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. And this world is fading away, isn't it? along with everything that people crave, but anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. You could have everything in the world. Matthew 16, 26 says, what good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? The kingdom of God is like the parable where the man found it in the field and he sold everything he had to buy that field so he could have the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is worth everything. This world has nothing for you. No redeeming qualities, nothing that's gonna help you get to the next place in life. Ignoring our sin problem or looking to the world to solve it is folly. My friend, I would appeal to you that you would believe in Jesus because this world still hasn't offered an answer, but Jesus has. That's my third point. Jesus gave his life to solve our sin problem. First John 3.16 says, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, for you and me. 
2 Corinthians 5, 21, again, for God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. And how are we made right? By putting our faith in Jesus Christ, by trusting in him instead of trusting in ourselves or in this world. Acts 4, 12 says, there is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. Ephesians 1, 7, he is so rich in, in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. My friend, you are forgiven of your sins. The sin problem that you've been wrestling with, the sins of our world that has affected us all, you have actually already been forgiven if you would believe, you would receive that forgiveness. Of all the religions in the world, this is true, of all the religions in the world, only Jesus has confronted the problem of sin and offered himself as the solution. You can search every religion in the world, every system of belief, every human philosophy, none of them offer a solution for sin and the solution being the leader, the savior, the centerpiece of that faith. No other religion offers that. The creator himself came in Christ to save you because he wants you back home with him. He took care of the sin problem because you and I can't. Fourthly, only Jesus has proved to be the solution for death and eternity. I purposely do not say that only Jesus has offered a solution for death and eternity. I purposely tell you today that only Jesus has proved to be the solution, the only solution for death and eternity. How do we know this? The most verified event in scripture and in history is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. When Jesus died on that cross, three days later, he rose again. We have evidence in books and books and books that something changed around the time of BC and AD. Our entire civilization is worked around those time stamps of before Christ and then after Christ died. Something changed. The disciples used to be afraid and they were hiding and now they're going out preaching the gospel. They're willing to die for what they saw. Over 500 witnesses saw Jesus walking around Jerusalem in Galilee for days. He rose again. Even the Romans acknowledged that something changed in the disciples because they hid and now they're out there boldly proclaiming the word of God, willing to die for him. The one who persecuted Christians, we learned last week, the Apostle Paul, Jesus showed up to him. Jesus is alive. This is what scripture says, John eleven twenty five. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Jesus is the resurrection and life. If you want to resurrect in the end, if you want to have eternal life, he is the one. John 14, 6, Jesus says this, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Audacious claim, isn't it? But why, why give any other offer if you are the offer and the only way? Why would we say there's more options when the one who is himself the option is saying, I am the way? Jesus would never lie to you. God has never lied. Scripture has never lied. Jesus has the audacious and bold claim that he is the only way to heaven. And he gave his life to show you, but he rose again to prove it. He rose again to prove it. Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. The world offers no answer for death or what happens after we die. There's no special serum to keep you alive forever. There's no shuttle that Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk will make to get into eternity. 
No matter how much money you have, you will not transfer from this life into eternity in heaven without Jesus Christ. Even if we did something to live for centuries, Jesus is coming back and judgment will be on all people. This will take place. Again, Jesus makes, and I would say the same, a bold appeal, a bold plea. Believe in Jesus Christ as the only way for eternal life. And lastly, tomorrow is not guaranteed. Church, earlier we heard a word in tongues. 1 Corinthians 12 says that God will give his people gifts to use, to edify, to build up the church. And we heard a word in tongues from the Lord, an interpretation of tongues that Jesus is coming back soon. The main message in that was to purify ourselves to be spotless and ready for his return because that is what he's coming for, is the church, the bride, ready for his return. According to the Bible, we are in the last days. When Jesus ascended into heaven, we began the last days. And Jesus is coming back soon. But we're not guaranteed that we will see tomorrow. Unfortunate events take the lives of people every day. And I realize that this is grim, but it's reality. You are not guaranteed tomorrow. We are not guaranteed the next two hours. What's important is right now, you can be ready for whatever happens in your life, whether it's death or whether Jesus comes back, you can be ready. Matthew 24 says, no one knows the day or hour when these things will happen. Not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Only the Father knows. When the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in Noah's day. In those days before the flood, the people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time of Noah. Uh, Noah entered his boat. People didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away. That is the way it will be when the Son of Man comes. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come in an hour when you do not expect him. Tomorrow, later today, is not guaranteed. But what you can have is eternal life right now in part if you believe in Jesus Christ. If you believe in Jesus Christ, to be the forgiveness of your sins and to receive eternal life, you are saved in God's eyes right now. So no matter what happens when we leave this place or whether you're done watching this video or this sermon, you can be ready. Jesus did this years ago. He's been calling us to come back to him for centuries. So in these five appeals, Jesus is the answer. And I realize that sounds like a... a, a bumper sticker, but I have given you reasons why, more than a bumper sticker. I have given you scriptures. I would beseech you, so to say, I would appeal to you that you would even consider checking this out. If you decide not to believe in Jesus Christ today, at least take these five things and let them rattle in your mind. Let them shake you investigate them yourself. Has the world really offered a solution for what's going on in our society, in our world? No one has. We're desperately trying, but we have not delivered. I don't think we can depend on man tomorrow either. But what we can depend on is a creator who has spelled out all of this from the beginning of time. And I would encourage you, if you're in this room today, I'm speaking to you today. If you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, please do. I say this out of love. I speak for God when I say, come back to him. He has already made a way. Even if you are the the worst of sinners, as we learned last week, the worst of sinners was saved. So that it could be an example of how gracious God is. Before we pray for that, I want to make an appeal to the church. Church, Jesus said, go and make disciples. 
more than he said, come. He said, come to the disciples because he went to them first. Jesus went. Jesus was a man on the go to reach the world. Then he invited them to come and believe. Church, we must not be the church that always just says, come. We must go. We must. We have been called to go out into our communities and share Jesus out there. This is not the only place that people can know Jesus. You are an ambassador, a sent one, to go out and share these appeals and any that you come up with, but please let it be used with scripture. Go, but before you go, go with power. Go in prayer. I wanna read to you what the Scottish evangelist Robert Morrison said. He was the first Christian Protestant missionary in China. And he was asked, now, Mr. Morrison, do you really expect that you will make an impression on the idolatry of the Chinese empire? And he answered, no, sir, but I expect God will. We can go out into our world in power because we've been in prayer and we've waited on the Holy Spirit to empower us, to fill us and to direct us. We are appealing for God, but it must be God. It must be his spirit working through us. Carolyn Tennant says this, the spirit then and now comes to those who pray and wait. He teaches and changes us. He prepares us and gives us insight on what he wants to say to people's hearts. He is the wooer, the changer, the transformer, the one who convicts and he who draws everyone to the savior. He wants to do incredible work today. He wants to do it through you. Church, we, had, we talked about these pews and how there's room here. Let it be that we have gone from here and go out and begin to reach the lost so that those pews will be filled eventually. Amen. <clears throat> to my friends in this room that don't have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he is a free gift. Everything he has is free. You don't pay for it. You don't memorize enough scripture to get it. You don't have to have a certain amount of knowledge or status in church. Jesus offers it to all of us because we are all at equal footing at the cross. And today the Holy Spirit's been working. He's been moving your heart to say, I need you. You're feeling it, that you need him. So maybe you've been feeling that. Maybe you've been saying, I need you, God. I agree with what's been said today. Well, let's pray together. Because you can admit that you are a sinner in need of Jesus. We all are, because we all have sin. And you can believe in Jesus Christ as the answer the salvation for your sin, and you can confess him as your Lord, your leader, your master, and savior today. And church, before I close with this prayer, we have little books of John out in the lobby with hope has a name on it, and it's tracks. This is a track, but it's a track that's not just a statement, it has scripture in it. Feel free to grab one, Pray over this. Pray that God will lead you to someone to give the book of John to. And in it is also direction on how someone can be saved in the beginning. We purchased these for you. If you want to take them, they're at the front. And uh, we appreciate your giving. It helped us purchase a lot of these. And so use this as a tool, as a track to share faith. And you can buy more online as well. Why don't we bow our heads and, and close our eyes. I've delayed long enough. If you're in this room and you feel the Holy Spirit moving, I just want you to know, last week at the 11 o'clock service, over 12 people gave their life to Jesus in this room. Amen. God is calling people back. He wants you home. He loves you. He forgives you. He wants to come and make his home inside your heart and life. Would you believe in him today? If that's you, every, 
every head bowed, eyes closed. If that's you, raise your hand because I want to know who I'm praying with today. Nothing to be afraid of. If you have never done this before, raise your hand. If you're in this room and you're saying, I'm, I've been off. I've been off. I've been, I've been walking the wrong way for a long time. But I know because my grandma told me, my dad, my mom, my church raised me to follow Jesus and I've been off. And you want to raise your hand as well. You can right now to recommit your life to him. Amen. Let's pray. Those of you watching online and those in this room, dear God, I am a sinner. Sin is real, but so is your grace. Thank you for the cross. I believe in Jesus Christ for the salvation of my sin. And I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and Savior of my life. And I choose today to follow him, to trust him, and I ask you to come into my life and make your home in my life. Come and dwell by your Holy Spirit and help me follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. Dear Lord, I thank you for this church. I thank you for this message. I thank you for this series. Our mission begins today. We've learned many things that we can use. Because this series is over doesn't mean that our mission is over. It just now continues even more. God, help us to go in the power of your Holy Spirit. We receive it. We don't depend on our own persuasive words. We depend on the Spirit's power. God, go with us. Use us. Teach us and guide us by your Spirit. Lord, help us to see the lost and feel for the lost the way you feel for them and the way you see them. And God, I pray that as we go, many will come. Many will come to be in our fellowship. Many will come to be part of the body where we can show them love and grace and truth so their lives can be transformed and sanctified by your word, by your spirit, and by the body of Christ. I thank you, Lord, for this church that cares. Lord, bless us and help us. God, thank you for the investment in this mission, Lord, with these little Bibles. And thank you, God, for the tithes and offerings and the prayers and the serving and the acts of love and blessing that are going on. Use all of it, God. We give it to you, God. We give you our lives. We surrender our lives as we heard today from you because you're coming back soon. Lord, we make ourselves ready, but we also help other people get ready. We give you all the glory and praise. And we thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's give God glory and praise for a moment. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord.